Good morning. Thank you for being here this morning to worship with us. We are uh, going to keep going in Acts this morning, but before we get there, uh, we're going to be talking about transformations today. And, and I was just going to share an example. Yesterday, um, my, my second oldest daughter had a, a, a lemonade event. For those of you who don't know, she sells lemonade. And so we were up on the square for about four hours, five hours up there selling lemonade. And, and immediately as that ended, she had prom to get ready for, right? And so for the... Uh, the event of the lemonade sales, she was in shorts and a t-shirt and her hair pulled up and, we, and the glasses and we were ready to go. We were in the zone. We were slinging lemonade across to everybody. It was fantastic. And noon hit and we're like, we got to get home because the, the, the house is getting ready to be turned into a beauty shop and the hair people are coming and the makeup people are coming. And I mean, it's un- unreal, right? And so within the, the span of two hours, she goes from AJ's lemonade owner and entrepreneur to prom ready, beautiful young woman. I didn't like it, but, but just the idea of the transformation. And, and you heard, um, I, my girls, they don't have to do the makeup. They don't have to do the hair to be beautiful. They know that. They know I think that. And so as her, her makeup's getting done, the, the gal doing it would look at me. She goes, what do you think? I'm like, I, I don't like it. <laughs> it's not that you're not doing a great job, but I don't like it. And, uh, but it was this physical transformation that you don't normally see in your children. And it, it was, she, she was beautiful as she took out to, to go to prom. We did some pictures in the sun and just the sparkle on her eyes. It was gorgeous, right? But then I knew, I knew last night that was it. It was done. And so I woke up this morning and I got on our, I, we have our camera system to watch the wildlife in the alley um, and things. <laughs> And I always check it to see what's been out there in the night. And at 10.30, I, or I don't know what time it was, I see Ava walking up the alley or, or down the alley to her car, coming back from post-prom or after-prom stuff, and she's in her shorts and her T-shirt. I'm like, ah, there's my daughter. <laughs> but it's a transformation that's just physical. It changes her appearance. She looks completely different than what we see her normally every day. But those types of things can be changed easily. You know, we can change our appearance. We can change those superficial things very quickly, very easily, without a lot of trouble. But the transformation we're going to talk about today, the transformation that we see in Acts chapter 16 is that internal transformation that only Christ can produce, that only He can do, that actually changes us from the old to this new creation. And so we're going to look at some examples, three examples of what the gospel can do, how it can transform people and learn from that. And so we come to to Paul's second missionary journey here. And during this journey, him and his companions reach out to Macedonia and and Achaia. And, And during this journey, we see the very first time that the gospel is planted on European soil. Now, We should get excited when we hear about the gospel being furthered, and for this to be the very first time that that, that in the the, the continent of Europe that we see the gospel planted, that should excite us to no end, because we know what what Europe does as as, as they expand, as they grow. They become a missionary, uh, they send missionaries all over. It's a, great, it's a great step in reaching the world for Christ. Now, the, now there weren't the, the, the lines between Asia and Europe in Paul's day, but, but this, this event truly is amazing when we consider it with the benefit of hindsight. We see what comes from this, from the start of, of the, the church of Philippi. And so the gospel eventually spreads throughout Europe, and Europe becomes that base for missionary outreach around the world. Paul and Barnabas Remember, they'd been sent by the, uh, the Jerusalem council with the letter to take it to Antioch to share with them, here's what we've decided on the Gentiles. And so they've, they've gone to do that. They've been there for a time. And Paul thinks and says, that's a good idea. Why don't we go revisit those churches? Remember the churches that he planted, the churches that he started? He came back and saw them on his way back on the first journey. He's still not done with them. He doesn't just leave them to their own. He's like, we need to go check on them. We need to go make sure they're doing okay. We need to make sure if there's anything we need to touch up on or minister to, we can do that. And so they, they start to, to make this decision. But as it happened, Paul doesn't actually end up going to, uh, to all the churches. He, he, he neglects to visit Cyprus because him and Barnabas have an issue. Him and Barnabas don't see eye to eye. And so Barnabas is the one that, that ends up going to Cyprus. And, and the reason I mentioned this division in the team is because it would have been real easy for Luke to kind of just gloss over this 
and say, you know what, uh, Barnabas went this way and Paul went this way. But it mentions that, that there's an issue there. There's something that's happened there. There's division in the team. And, and it's, it's not just something simple, something, it's very serious. They have this, these, these competing views and, and it's a sharp disagreement and there's this intense conflict between them. And we, like I said, we might think, why do they include that in there? Because we need to know, we need to remember that, that these missionaries, while they're great men, they're just men. They're flawed humans. This isn't outside the, the realm of possibility for them to have conflict, for them to have issues between themselves. But, but the reality is we should be encouraged by this because God sovereignly works through this conflict to achieve his purposes. Sometimes in spite of what we do and how we get in the way, he still accomplishes what he plans to accomplish. And so the result of this split is that instead of one missionary journey, we actually see that there are two now. Now, this doesn't, this doesn't imply that all Christian arguments are justified, but it does tell us that God can work through all sorts of means to advance his gospel. Sometimes we can put a lot of weight on ourselves and think, well, if I'm going to mess it up, I'm going to mess it up. Here was a big, a big sidestep. It could have ended a lot of things, and God uses it in a great way. And so I, I want to make sure we touch on those things when they happen in Scripture, just so we understand it wasn't just easy going for them. It wasn't just simple and everybody got along and the church unity was fantastic all the time. There were some divisions, there were some conflicts, but God uses them as well. And so as in previous weeks, we're not going to read all of chapter 16. We're going to just read pieces of it, but go back. I encourage you, go back, read it all, study it for yourself this week in light of what we're going to hear, hear today. And so we're going to, the, the one thing I want to touch on and make you aware of is as we start to read this, you're going to see Luke kind of shifts how he's writing. He's now including himself in the story. He talks about we doing things, we going here. And so he's now put himself in the story. So you know he's there as a firsthand account, a firsthand witness of what's happening. And so we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 13. It says, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate by the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down to, and spoke to the women gathered there. A God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. After she and her household were bap... Did I jump? Yes. I'm sorry. After she and her household were baptized, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once as we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She made a large profit for her owners by fortune telling. As she followed Paul and us, she cried out, these men who are proclaiming to you a way of salvation are the servants of the most high God. She did this for many days. Paul was greatly annoyed turning to the spirit. He said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and, came out, and it came out of her right away. We're going to stop there for a minute. So here you see right off two transformations. You see Lydia come to know Christ and you see this, this young girl who, who is tormented by demons. She, she is freed and delivered from that. And after this happens, the, the owners of the girl, this, this girl was owned by others. She's a slave girl. They throw a fit. They blame Paul and Silas for things that they hadn't even done. They charge Paul and Silas with imposing an alien religion. They, here, here's the reality. They were upsetting the balance of the entire city. It was under Roman jurisdiction, and it was against the Roman law to teach foreign religions. And so to get a judgment against Paul and Cyrus, Silas, these owners add to their charges, which is exactly what happened to Christ if you go back and read his story. And so they find him guilty. They beat them with sticks and rods. It's kind of like, like caning the, the, the they just strike him with these things repeatedly. There's no limit for how many blows. If you go to the, the Jewish law, when they did it, they had a list of here's how many times it can be. There was none of that here. So we have no idea how much they endured, how much they took, um, but they were badly beaten by this. Then they're in prison, but not just in a cell. They kind of put them down in the deepest, darkest parts. I mean, by this point, people know that the men of God, when they get jailed, things happen and they escape. So they're worried. So they put them clear down in the dungeon. They, they, they put stocks on their feet. And so they're not going anywhere. After all of this, we see their response. They end up singing the glories of God as they sit there in pain, bloodied, locked in. And they're singing the praises 
of God. And then God moves in a way that only God can move. And he shakes the ground. And, and the, the, the doors open, the, the, the chains come off. They're free. That creates a problem for the jailer. That's where we pick up in verse 27. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out in a loud voice, don't harm yourself because we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He escorted them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all his family were baptized. He brought them into the house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. So then we see this third transformation. The one that jailed them, the one that put them in the stocks, the one that put them in the dungeon has now come to Christ, come to faith in Christ because the gospel was presented there. We see in this passage just how Jesus transforms people with the gospel message. See, we sometimes think we are the ones that help people transform. It's not on us. It's the gospel message. It's the word of God. It's his message that brings people to Christ. My prayer today is as we walk through this, you think back to your transformation. If you're a believer, if you've been born again, you've experienced this transformation. It has happened in your life. Go back and look at it. Go back and remember it. See what trajectory that that put you on. When you you first encountered Christ, how did it change you and where did it bring you? And then also, as we do this, I want us to understand that that it leads itself into this life of service for him. We're going to see what what Lydia becomes in the scheme of things. We're going to anticipate some of the things that that happen at the end of this. But, But for us, once we've experienced that transformation, what better way to speak about Jesus than the personal experience we've had? to share that gospel with others. So we're going to take our time today and look at these transformations, beginning with the transformation of Lydia. So Philippi, when they get there, it doesn't have any Jewish synagogues. And so on the Sabbath day, they go to the closest thing that there is to a synagogue. And it's just this place set aside for prayer that's outside the city gates. It's located by the river. And so these men go there and they start to visit with all the women there. And one of them is named Lydia. And, and here's, here's the reality with Lydia. She's got to be a wealthy person because she's selling these purple goods. And, and purple goods are expensive. And so it, it, a lot of times it's associated with royalty. And so this business was something that was very profitable. Her, her, she, she hosted people in her home as well. We read about that. It implies that she was indeed a woman of means. She lived a good life. She had an area where she could bring people to. Luke tells us that she was a God-fearing woman. It's kind of like the story of Cornelius. The description doesn't necessarily tell us that she's a Christian, but she's seeking God. Here she's got everything. She's got a business. She's making money. She's got a beautiful home. She can bring people to, and yet she knows there's more. She's seeking something more to fulfill her life. Perhaps she had read Ezekiel in which the Lord promises to give a new heart and a new spirit to people. Regardless of whether the prophecy was something she had thought about, she was the beneficiary of it because uh, the Lord opens up her heart. What does this mean? It means the God of all grace opened her spiritual eyes so that she could embrace Jesus as Lord. He shows her, he reveals to her, this is that next step. This is what's missing is a relationship with Christ. It's like we read in 2 Corinthians 4, for we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. God works in Lydia's heart and gave her new life as she heard the gospel. That's the power of the gospel. I I, I again don't think we fully understand the power of the gospel. We think we have to present it in such and such a way. We've got to make sure we take this step and this step and this step. Sometimes the gospel is more powerful than we give give it credit for. And we see that here. We see that in Lydia's life. She wasn't won over by Paul's effective communication. I'm sure he was a great communicator, but that's not what did it. That's not why she was converted. 
That was by God's gracious and saving initiative that she was saved. Lydia was saved in the same way that anyone else is that that finds Christ. So here we have the first mention. This is the very first time that someone converts to faith in Christ on European soil. That's exciting in and of itself. Because we're seeing the gospel start to, to reach places that it's never reached before. Reach places that it's going to cause it to have an even bigger impact. So she becomes the first one. We can't, we can't really help but admire the quietness of this either, right? This wasn't like a, 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 a big revival that was happening and, and there was singing and there was preaching. It was a quiet conversation between people that becomes this world-changing event. It's a setting that may have well resembled more of a picnic than a prayer meeting. Here they are just kind of gathered around praying. Here in an area that's not a church. Did you know people can get saved outside a church? Sometimes we don't think that, but it happens. Maybe it kind of lacks the drama from, from perspective of, of the pastor buyers, but, but the Lord is at work here, and he's at work in a big way. Paul, what he does is he explains the gospel to her, and the Lord transforms this individual into a follower of King Jesus. He opens Lydia's heart, kind of like a flower opens to the sun. I don't know if you've ever seen those videos where, where a flower opens up, closes up at night, and it opens, it's always in the direction of the sun. That's what her heart did. It opens up. It hears the gospel message, and she embraces that message. And for, for people who are not Christians, we need to encourage them to listen to the gospel being preached. Just encourage them to sit and listen to a gospel presentation doesn't have to be flashy, doesn't have to be excellent, it just has to be the biblical gospel being presented. Let them hear that and see what impact that can have on them. Encourage them to go and read John or Acts and just let them interact with scripture and see how powerful it is. Let, encourage them to see if the Lord might do something in their hearts because they've encountered the good news. That's how powerful the word of God is. That's how powerful the gospel is. It can cause them to, to, to confess Jesus as Lord. For us as believers, remember that the Lord still does converting work through messengers of the gospel. It still happens today. This didn't end when, when the church was built. The church is still being built. There are people still out there presenting this gospel all over. We're to be doing it. This is what we're called to do. Our job is not over. Our, our Lydia could be out there waiting for us to mention the com or to have a conversation with her about the gospel. They're out there. They're all over. It's time for us to see them, to seek them out, to talk with them. Trust when the Bible is taught that God does work in people's lives. After, after this conversion, based on her confession of faith, she's baptized. But it's not just her. It's her whole household. This isn't just one conversion. This isn't just one person being transformed. It trickles over into the rest of the people in her household. Probably her servants as well are included in this. The, the, those had to have believed through the witness of Paul and the witness of Lydia. Lydia not only shares her faith with her household, though, she goes on and opens her home up to these missionaries. These apostles affirm her profession of faith and accept this invitation to come into her home the location of which eventually becomes a gathering place for the entire church of Philippi. This one woman now has a place for the church to begin, for the church to meet, the church to start. She provides a wonderful example of generosity and hospitality for us. She accepts Christ, she's transformed, and she says, okay, let's open it up. Not just me. And now here her household is, here she's opened her home. Later, Paul writes about the wonderful generosity and the support of the church in Philippi. And it's not difficult to imagine Lydia was one of the main con contributors to whom he refers here. I mean, she's, that's just who she is. That's what she does. Once again, in Acts, we see the use of someone's home as a wonderful tool for ministry. How many of you view your home as a place for ministry? You should. We should be opening our homes to have people in to, to eat around the table, to talk about the Lord, to, to, to pray together, to study together. Homes are a great place to build deep relationships, to build accountability between people. They're a great place for ministry. 
Lydia gives us a great example of what that looks like. We, we should seek to practice hospitality to serve the church. Use your home to serve others. I encourage you in all that. Allow your transformation to impact the kingdom in a, in a positive way. That's what we're called to do. So we go from, from this, this very quiet, this very subdued gospel transformation to this next one where we see this transformation of a slave girl. And the contrast between this girl and Lydia could not have been greater, what, what, which makes this stark contrast to show how the saving name of Jesus proved its power in the lives of the most diverse types. Lydia and this girl had nothing in common. They didn't come from the same walk of life. And here we still see Jesus moved. We still see transformation. Luke and Paul, they obviously understand this girl to be demon-possessed. She was a clairvoyant. She's making predictions. She's uttering these words in, in strange voices. And because the locals considered such fortune tellers to be inspired by Apollo or, or the Python, they, they sought them out to hear their predictions about the future. This was part of their culture. This is part of what they did. They believed in this stuff and they, they sought it out. There was a large profit in this business. People paid good money to hear what their future was going to be. That's probably why the, 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 the girl's owners, they didn't really feel sorry for her. They were making money off of her. They really didn't care about who she was. They cared about the, the, the bottom line here. They treated her like property. See, she's in double bondage, honestly, because she's treated like property and because she's abused by this de demonic spirit. Satan tries to derail the missionaries, just like he, he does not want the word of God going out. He does not want people to know this or hear this. And so he tries, tries to distract from this. He, tries to, he attempts to form an alliance with the missionaries for his own purposes. He's like, if I can get this girl attached to these, these men, it'll thwart everything they're trying to do. He's trying to use her to associate Paul's message with the occult. But, but the missionaries obviously needed dis to distance their ministry from the evil work. They knew this. You go back to the gospel and you see demon-possessed people there and, 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 and they knew who Jesus was. Every time that he encounters a demon, they know he's the son of God. They know Jesus better than we do, right? They, they're aware that he's there. They're aware of what he's doing. And, and, we, and again, let's look at the example of Luke chapter 4. Where th these are the demons, let us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And what does he do? He rebukes them. He says, be silent, come out of him. And he throws him down before them. And the demon came out of them without hurting him at all. So Paul comes to a point where he gets so annoyed with this, 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 this girl doing this, with Satan's attempts to associate with the team, he frees her with a word in Jesus' name. Again, we see the power of Jesus' name. We see the power of the word. This girl is freed. The demon is cast out. Jesus masterfully crushes serpents. With this move of power of Christ is displayed. The girl is delivered. She's a whole new person. What a relief it had to be to that poor girl. She, she like, you go back into Mark, and, and, and she's, she's a whole new being. You go, go back to Mark, like I said, Mark chapter 5. Look what it says there. They came to Jesus. They saw the man who had been possessed by demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They'd only known him one way. And so to see him like he should be, it scared him. This girl, the same thing. The demon had been cast out of her, and she was a new creation. She'd been delivered from being under that oppression. We, we presume that she also becomes a follower of Jesus after the deliverance. She suddenly had a new owner, the only good shepherd, her Lord Jesus Christ. He had freed her spiritually and physically and given her peace and joy and freedom and rest. What a very different transformation from what we saw in Lydia. You contrast the two. You've got Lydia, this wealthy woman. You've got this girl who's poor. You've got Lydia. She's this community member of high standing. And this girl was exploited and abused. Lydia's religious and moral. And, and, and the girl's broken and tormented. Lydia comes to, to faith through this quiet Bible study. And this girl gets transformed through the dramatic power of the name of Jesus. While Lydia was presented with the Jesus as Messiah, the girl experienced Jesus as the mighty deliverer. These two ladies, both brought to faith in Christ, 
It's a reminder that Jesus, the gospel, can transform all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds. You do know that not all believers are Southern Baptist. Okay, I just want to make sure. We do know that they're not all Americans. Okay. The, the, this is what we've got to understand. The, the, the gospel can transform anyone. We don't get to pick and choose. We don't get to decide. It transforms all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds. This power that brought the evil spirit out of this girl is the same power that opened Lydia's heart. Same Jesus. It's his power. Sometimes we want to distance ourselves from, from, from things like this powerful encounter this girl has because we don't think it relates to us. But here's the reality. As she was delivered from that demon, that same power, that same power in Christ can deliver us from the things we struggle with as well. If we've got addictions, he can help us in that. If, if we, we just have those, those issues of negative thinking, he can help us with it. Whatever it is, if he can break the power of a demon... He can break the power of what's over us. It's a wonderful reminder that because of him, he is Lord over all. And we've got to believe that. We've got to know that. Let us see gospel transformations can happen in any life. We don't decide it. We've talked about this before in here that that sometimes we see people and we think, well, they're too far gone. They're they're far beyond what, what God... No, they're not. No one's beyond God. His word is powerful enough to save anyone who will be. Finally, in this section of scripture, we see that Jesus brings about the transformation of the jailer. After they upset this this economy and they caused this major disturbance in Philippi, these these owners, they, they, they were out a lot of money and they were not happy about it. And so they file these false charges against Paul and Silas. They, they claim they're disturbing the city. They're advocating unlawful customs. And the crowd starts to join in the attack. And the magistrates come, and they order them to be beaten with rods. It was all false. None of it was true. But they go through with it. And they beat them, and they beat them, and they beat them. Again, we don't know to what extent that, or how many they, 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 they received. It's difficult to imagine the torture they, they underwent. But here they are left swollen and bruised and, and, and lacerated. They're sticky with blood. They're already in a position where, where they probably couldn't even lay down on their backs because they'd been beaten so bad. And so they take them to the jail and they shove them in the dungeon, the deepest, darkest part of it. And then they put stocks on their feet. Now, how many of you, if you had endured that, would have thought, hey, you know what I should do? Sing the praises of God. How many of us, if that had been us, would have thought, you know what? This is the perfect time to give God praise. How many of us, when you stub your toe, think, I'm going to praise God right now? Especially your little toe in the middle of the night and it's dark, you can't see anything. Or the, the new thing I'm learning is, is, you know, when like you're in a bad mood and you walk by something and it catches your clothing. Has that ever happened to you? Like, I'm running out the door, I'm already upset, and it catches me, and I'm, I'm like, I get mad at the door. I don't know why I get mad at the door. It's always there. But in those moments, the last thing I want to do is go, praise God, he's teaching me patience, he's telling me to slow down. I mean, that's not my thought. After everything they've suffered, everything they've endured, the place that they're at, where Peter slept in prison, Paul and Silas sing in prison. Sleeping and singing are both expressions of faith and peace in the Lord. Those hearing their their, their raised voices of these men, they had to be astonished by their example of faith amid suffering. I'm sure they were all aware of what had happened, of what what had been done to them. And here they were singing. They were quoting scripture. They They were pouring out their hearts in prayer to all of this. All these prisoners had to listen to it. I'm sure there was no way to block it out. Maybe they were listening, listening eagerly to hear what they were saying because who has an attitude like that? Who, who lifts their voice to sing in the situation they're in? And, and in the midst of that, God shakes the earth. God, God shakes the earth. He breaks the chains, which is one of his specialties. Lights go out, doors are open, and the jailer panics. He fears the consequences of having to go to them and say, I lost them all. The prison is empty. And so he's prepared to just end his life. 
Paul and Silas could have gone, could have fleed, but they don't. They choose to stay there. They choose to to pause and, and, and save this man's life, not just in one way, but in two ways. This jailer, as he he hears their voices, he says, I need some light. I've got to see these men. I've got to see who they are. Something's different about them. Something's not not the same as what I know. And he goes to them and and he, he starts to ask them, what must I do to be saved? The things they were singing had to be the gospel message that he heard. And here they present it in yet another way. This jailer knew about the girl. He knew how she had been delivered, and he, handled, he had handled this incarceration of this missionary pair. He had probably been listening to their songs, and the earth rocked beneath him, and the question makes a lot of sense. And so they point the jailer to the man that can save them, the, the, the savior of Lydia, the savior of the girl. They point him and tell him that Jesus is the only one that can transform you. That's the only person who can save you. But he doesn't and can't just save you. He can save your whole family. We've got to keep telling people that all who believe in the Lord Jesus will be saved. We've got to keep telling people they need to hear that message They need to to hear it proclaimed by us. We're kind of reminded of this in Romans 4 where it says, this is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace to guarantee it to all the descendants, not only to the one who is of the law, but also the one who is of Abraham's faith. He is the father of us all. The jailer goes back to his house. They all hear the gospel. They all believe the gospel. They're all baptized into the faith. The jailer, in an act of humility and repentance then, begins to wash the wounds of these men that had been beaten. Once their captor, now here he is caring for them. He goes on and he he serves them a meal. This is a sweet picture of transformation. A Roman guard, and here he is taking care of those that he had jailed. No longer did he view them as prisoners, but now they were brothers in Christ. In this wonderful picture of gospel hospitality, the jailer and his family rejoice in this new life that they have. Maybe they even start to sing some of these songs that that, that Paul and Silas were singing in prison. He's jolted by this miracle. He's converted to faith in Christ through the proclamation of the gospel. His his story is another reminder that no one is beyond the reach of God's saving grace. We've got to remember that. We've got to see that. This account highlights the gospel's unifying power as well. We, We see these three transformations, all very separate, all in their own right, all in different locations, different people, but it unifies them in the end. See, Jesus incorporates all kinds of people into his family. And then he intends those individuals that he saves to serve one another as brothers and sisters on a common mission. You read through the rest of this chapter and you see this new congregation start up at Philippi. You see this new church plant begin to take shape. Paul and Silas release, uh, are released then by, by the magistrates. They've seen all this. They've endured all this. They've watched it all. They, saw the, they felt the earthquake probably. They, they see the jailbreak that could have been. They want them out. They're like, we can't deal with this anymore. But before they're gone, look at what's occurred. This, this transformation of Lydia, this transformation of this girl, this transformation of this jailer and this birth of a church. Don't miss that before this journey to Philippi, there were no spiritual brothers and sisters in Philippi. They went there seeking people. But now because of Jesus' power, Paul and Silas could meet with several members of their spiritual family. Among them were these three. Now think about the lives that these three led. They had nothing in common other than Christ at this point. They, their, their paths probably never would have crossed. They never would have been uh, in the same place at the same time. But now, because they're citizens of heaven, now because they've experienced this transformation in Christ, here they are forming the church. This is what the church is. In Christ, people from all types of backgrounds, we're united as fellow believers. This was God's design. This is how he intended to make the gospel go across the world. 
to every corner, to every nation. This is where we see the first church on European soil established. See, what's certain here is that God did indeed begin a good work in Philippi, bringing so many people to faith in Christ and establishing this foothold in Europe as he did so. I mean, think about that. Think of the implications of the church of Philippi. What a privilege to hear and receive this gospel. What a joy to partner in advancing the gospel with other brothers and sisters who confess Jesus as Lord. That's what we're called to do together as believers. I want us to, to be a people that seek his guidance, that, that, that trust in his power and declare his salvation every day from here to wherever we go until the day he returns. See, if we've experienced that transformation, we have a story to tell. And while we like to think it's our story, it's really not. It's his. It's what he's done in us, what he does through us. But this is how God intends the world to hear, is through his church. So as you've reflected on your transformation today, I want you to start to shift your mind to now how you can take your transformation story and share it with others. What does that look like? Where do you do that? And for anybody that's not taken that step, anybody that hasn't experienced or, or had a transformation in Christ, that's the first step, and you need to talk with me, and you need to talk with me quick. My hope is that as we continue to to ingrain and, and seed the, 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 the great commission down in our hearts, that this becomes just part of who we are, part of our DNA, that when we go, we tell. Whether it's in a quiet conversation, whether it's in a heated discussion, whether it's in front of a bunch of people, whether it's in front of one, God can use all of those to glorify Him. If we'll take comfort in knowing the power of the gospel, the power of His Word to bring people to Himself, we can take a little pressure off of us. It's a great story. It's a great account of, of what we need to look to do. The other part of this that I wanted to just kind of put in our minds is that idea of hospitality that we see. We see it from Lydia. We see it from the jailer. Opening their homes, taking care of one another providing a meal where they can. In this day and age, we kind of like build our homes as our kingdoms and they're ours and it's our place. It may be time to open those doors, invite people in for lunch, invite people in to, to eat together, to work together, to pray together, to sing together, whatever it is. And I'm not talking about just people here. We got people outside of here that need Christ more and more. Not that we don't need the fellowship but they need to hear the truth at any opportunity that they can. As today, as we respond through song, I want you to kind of think on those things about your transformation and how that impacts your ability to serve Him today. Be praying for what your next steps are, what that looks like as you go, go about your day-to-day -day life. I'm going to invite the team to come as they prepare to, to lead us in our song. I'm going to invite you to stand as we pray before this time of response. Father God, once again, we thank you for this opportunity to hear your word. We thank you for the story of these transformations that only you could do in the lives of these individuals. Father, we see the impact that it wasn't just these three, but, but two of them, their households come to know you. And so as, as they left this place, Father, there was a church starting to, to continue on the work that you had begun. Father, help us to see ourselves in this story. Help us to go back to our story of transformation and see how that has impacted our lives to a point that we're out there sharing what you've done with others around us. Just help us to give you glory for that. Help us to, to be prepared to follow in obedience wherever you lead us to talk about you. And Father, once again, we just give you the glory for all you're doing in our lives and through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.